All right. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone as, as you roll in here. Um, there is a little poll. Uh, be very grateful should you should you uh, give your best answer there. Uh, we'll get back to this in a few minutes' time. Great. All right. So uh, as people are are joining, uh, like to see like to see those uh, polls um, uh, answered. Uh, very interested in in everyone's in everyone's thoughts on this topic. Uh, we will be kicking off the main session here in the next thirty seconds or so. Once a couple, once a couple more of our attendees roll in, and and uh, looking forward forward to getting started. All right, so let's get things kicked off here. Uh, warm welcome to everybody in attendance today and everybody watching the replay uh, wherever and whenever you are. Uh, my name is Eric Cross and I will be the host for today's uh, session. Uh, I am the head of sales and digital marketing for Alibaba.com in North America. Uh, joining us today, we are delighted to welcome Sophie Freres, uh, CEO and co-founder of Lisa Social Commerce as well as Kareem Kfouri, president of the Atlas Network. We're, we're very happy to have these, these experts join us for this uh, very in-depth exploration of a critical topic for small businesses today. So uh, today we're going to have a bit of a special session. In the first bit, I'm going to introduce some concepts around omni-channel strategies uh, for sales and marketing. Then I'm going to briefly introduce some of Alibaba.com's solutions uh, for omnichannel ecosystems and such. Uh, we are going to spend the majority of our time having a panel discussion with our two experts, uh, where we will welcome audience questions as well as some that, that we've prepared for them. And we are uh, looking forward to having a very uh, in-depth session on this topic. Of course, uh, should you have any questions during the sharing, you are very free to share those in the chat and we will get to them uh, once we can. So just kicking things off here, um, we're going to look at the, the background uh, of Omnichannel as well as what that is. And I asked everybody to take a look at that poll that populated once you joined and just to summarize here, um, here are the options for what is omnichannel strategy. You can see a marketing approach that focuses exclusively on digital channels to engage with customers, a strategy that combines both online and offline channels, allowing customers to interact with the brand seamlessly across multiple channels, a sales tactic that relies solely on traditional brick and mortar stores, stores without any online presence, and finally, a customer service method that prioritizes phone and email support over the forms of communication. So let's see how we're doing so far. All right, maybe I made this poll too easy. We've got 100% uh, feedback for option B, which is the correct option. So well done, everybody. So Omnichannel is essentially a strategy that combines multiple channels and touch points and aims to seamlessly interact with customers across those touch points. Uh, consistency and brand centrism is our customer centricism is always going to be a key topic or a key concept for this topic. Unlike multi-channel, which many companies are doing today, uh, even doing a very good job, uh, Omnichannel um, Omnichannel completely integrates the uh, the technology and the strategy behind the operations of each channel. Uh, so, so you might you might instead of having one team uh, handling, let's say, uh, offline events and another team handling ecom, uh, these these teams would be highly integrated, um, both from a technical as well as a strategic perspective. Couple fun facts. 95% uh, of marketers understand the importance of omnichannel, but only about 30% feel confident that they are doing it effectively. So this is a pretty big gap in, in the attitudes and behaviors of, of marketers around the world. And also, uh, we can see that 
businesses uh, can enjoy a, a much higher retention rate of customers, meaning a longer life cycle and also a longer customer value during that life cycle uh, compared to businesses that have fairly weak omni-channel presence. So when we are considering how to set up our omni-channel mix, there's, there's a lot of things that go into this. Uh, of course, you need to you need to keep your customer in mind all the time. So where are they? What are they doing when they're there? And so on, um, so that you know the best way to interact with customers uh, on, on your given channels. Uh, of course, your business goals always have to be front and center as well. Are, are you looking to enhance your brand awareness? Are you looking to uh, cultivate an existing customer base? Or are you looking to to grow an incremental one? Uh, finally, your your budget and resources. Actually, I I I I would summarize this as your capabilities, and we're going to get to that shortly. But you really need to think about your bandwidth, what you're capable of of executing, uh, not just planning. Uh, it might sound really great in theory, uh, but but there may be some some uh, aspects of of your desired mix that are unworkable today, and you need to build those capabilities. Of course, uh, have a look at what your competitors are doing. Chances are they've also examined those uh, those very same uh, items uh, prior to selecting um, any given channel in their mix. So, <clears throat> how how businesses can can determine their ideal mix? Some suggestions would include a simple review of capabilities, strengths, weaknesses, and so on, as well as what, what type of external factors you are looking to leverage or avoid. Um, uh, again, we get back to being very customer centric here, uh, where you, uh, many teams are going to be mapping their entire customer journey, whether it's via social channels, via email channels, and so on, uh, in order to pinpoint the ideal conversions that are going to lend to business results. Other factors to consider, uh, shoppers, shoppers, uh, well, they're not really exclusive to one channel these days. They will, they will, they will go and do their research across multiple channels, oftentimes before uh, a single interaction, whether it's, whether it's um, getting in touch or, or placing an order. And, and I'll stress um, on the second there, uh, we're talking about initial orders because follow-up orders are going to typically be a little bit more involved. So, um, very vast majority of customers are are uh, not exclusive and they are doing a lot of research prior to engaging with you. So even before you get that first uh, conversion, you should have some data points for for these customers. So when you're when you're trying to suss out um, your balance uh, or your mix, you need to consider obviously the the business case. So everybody is, is well aware that ROI is going to be uh, uh, forefront with any consideration for, for any business activity. Um, but because of the long tail effect that an, uh, that an effective omni-channel strategy can have, uh, it is also very important to consider longer tail impact, such as the return on ad spend, uh, customer acquisition cost, and how this affects those as well as the, the life cycle and, and lifetime value of the customers earned through this approach. So um, if, we're, if we're talking about um, what impact your omni-channel uh, strategy can have on your own business, um, just a, a, a few uh, fundamental uh, data points here. Um, conversion from digital interactions is improved massively by having a robust omni-channel uh, strategy because the, the experience from uh, one channel to another, um, they should synergize rather than, than contradict. And should they do that, then, um, then you are looking at a, a 50 plus percent increase in sales. Uh, a, an impact in terms of B2B orders, which is a, which is a personal favorite of, of my own, um, is you can see that purchasing decisions don't typically all happen within a single channel. Upward 70% of these are actually uh, occurring across multiple channels prior to uh, the initial engagement. All right. And of course, the bottom line impact is upward 9 to 10% increased revenue. So I, I, I hope that that, uh, that is powerful enough to get some attention. 
So um, one final uh, key consideration for everyone today is if you're if you're determining your your strategic omni-channel mix, is it better to have a very um, focused strategy or a very balanced one? Now there are pros and cons of each, um, and so I would I would always recommend first considering um, low hanging fruit. Right, what is the business capable at? Do you have experience in any given channel that will map perfectly over to another or almost perfectly over to another? And, and, and on the other hand, if, if you already have these channels working for you and producing results, um, consider adding a channel to supplement those, a, a channel that could be quite different, provided that your, your company's resources, capabilities, and bandwidth can support that. So just to give some background on Alibaba's contribution to the conversation, uh, I, want to, I want to just share share a little bit of history about Alibaba.com and, and a sense of, of what we are accomplishing in the years to come. So 25 years ago, Alibaba.com was formed and uh, this was the first business unit in Alibaba Group. Since we have built an entire ecosystem around uh, digital commerce, digital services, and so on, all lend well to a, 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 an omni-channel strategy within a single ecosystem. And our goal with this is eventually to be able to offer these um, globally through um, through a variety of channels to let, let businesses build their omni-channel within the ecosystem. As you see, we've, we've made a lot of progress in those 25 years from essentially um, offering a directory of OEM and white label manufacturers to a full suite, including transaction support, advertising options, even prospecting tools to help you um, generate business leads quickly. And, and just a little background, why we are so laser focused on B2B, it's really the size of the price being about six times larger than that of D2C. The types of, of businesses that are sourcing on Alibaba.com, as you can see, would typically include distributors, manufacturers, institutions, and, uh, and various forms of resellers. And as you can see, they are sourcing product across 40 industries, nearly 6,000 product categories. Uh, and they are sourcing out of 200 plus countries and regions. In fact, I think it'd be a lot quicker to, to, to list the ones that we are not active in than the ones that we are. And this really all culminates to what we call a hybrid marketplace where, um, where you can either use the channel to generate uh, leads and opportunities, you can use it to generate transactions instantly or a little bit of both. So where are we today? Now, this is a great, um, a great transition into our upcoming panel shortly. Um, but what we can see here is that the very vast majority of manufacturers and small businesses don't have a very robust digital presence. And what that means is that they, they are most likely playing in a lot of traditional channels. And now it'd be time to start considering um, adding an incremental uh, digital one or two. So with that, I would just like to welcome our panelists for today, and I will offer a very quick introduction. Also, their links are going to be here should you want to take a picture or screenshot uh, and get in touch with them post-session. So first, I would like to welcome uh, Sophie Freres, who is the co-founder and CEO of Lisa, a SaaS startup providing live and social commerce solutions for top global brands like Marks & Spencer, L'Oreal, and Avon. She's also a guest lecturer at Columbia University, specializing in social and live commerce. So she's, Sophie's mission with Lisa is to help e-tailers transform into socially di social discovery destinations, enabling seamless cross-platform experiences for their communities. Should I have missed something? I'm sure uh, she will fill us in very shortly. Uh, we are also joined by Kareem Kfuri, President and CEO of the Atlas Network, a supply chain enterprise offering end-to-end -end services from consulting and product development to logistics and storage. He also founded the Global Crosswalk, a SaaS platform that streamlines project life cycles in the supply chain industry and co-hosts the Supply and Demand Show on YouTube. 
Finally, I will mention that, that Kareem just published a new book called The Supply Chain Seesaw, and I've left a link to that as well here. So kicking things off, um, Sophie, I would like to I would like to welcome you to the stage to just briefly introduce yourself and Lisa um, and and just give a, a, a quick sense of of, uh, of your interest in this topic today. Yeah, Eric, thank you so much for having me. Um, my company's name is Lisa, and I often get called Lisa. So maybe for context, why did we name the business Lisa? It was originally um, actually a working project title. It was short for Live Shopping Assistant. <laughs> um, and I think it's like 2018, so almost six years ago, I went into my first startup pitch, just pitching the idea. And we just kind of named it Lisa, just so it had a name. And then we won the pitch. And so that's how the name Lisa stuck. <laughs> so that's how we found our business name. And yeah, and now fast forward six years later, we're a full suite of uh, social commerce SaaS solutions and management solutions. So essentially, as you said, uh, you know, we help brands and retailers run their social commerce activities across all channels, right? So the idea of omnichannel is also very much ingrained in what we do. And at the center of it all is this core hypothesis that we have, which is that any digital business or any business that is also digital has to become community centric, not just customer centric to survive. And while that sounds like it might be easy or, um, you know, it probably isn't. And if, if it may sound, you know, that it's off somewhere in the future, that also is not true. I mean, as Alibaba, you of course know very well in China, already one third of all e-commerce is happening through social commerce experiences. We don't see any reason why that won't be the case here as well. By here, I mean, let's say rest of the world. Um, yeah, that's why we're enabling essentially also the infrastructure to scale such social commerce and essentially community-centered commerce is what it is. Um, but if you think about, again, infrastructure and what that means, it means quite a shift, right? Also in how you design omni-channel strategies and so on. So that's how that ties in uh, to this topic of omni-channel and why it's so important to us as well. Fantastic, thanks Thanks for that. And I'd also like to welcome Kareem Kfuri. Um, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Atlas Network and and uh, what what types of implications uh, Omnichannel has had had for your business recently? Absolutely, uh, thank you so much, Eric. I really appreciate uh, you know the introduction. Um, you know, we have been working for almost two decades here in the realm of global supply chain solutions, and in doing so. We work with small to mid-sized businesses um, from all different types of industries and get to know a lot about their companies, their brands, how they decide to go to market, how they represent their, their organization or their products. And although we're primarily on the supply chain side and on the manufacturing side, it all is very well integrated because the decisions to produce certain products and SKUs or try new things you know, there's a lot of feedback that has to come from the industry and from potential customers or even, you know, different business partners. So we're consistently working with, you know, hundreds of clients across millions of products and very much in tune with the importance of uh, omni-channel with regards to feedback, with regards to just basic business development and where our customers are going. You know, outside of that, you know, talking about particular industries and products and companies, you know, we ourselves, as a business to business organization, you know, have, have implemented several uh, omni channel strategies, uh, both online and offline, to basically promote the brand and our services and the things that we do. Uh, and so I think in that way, it's a very relevant and important topic and happy to be a part of it today. Yeah, we're, we're very delighted to, to be joined by you and Sophie today. So uh, I'd like to, to transition into a couple of um, questions that, that we have uh, for Sophie and Kareem to, to just get things uh, kicked off. And of course, um, any question uh, that you want to jump in on, feel very free to. Um, so th this first one is for Sophie. Uh, so we, we covered some of those considerations that businesses uh, ought to have when determining their omni-channel strategy. 
Uh, what are some of the key considerations that that um, that you would recommend, especially from a social commerce or or social to commerce perspective? Well, typically people associate social commerce with selling stuff on social media, and while that is a part of it, that's only surprisingly the smaller piece of it. Um, actually, there's equally the sort of reverse trend where you have co uh, social media like experiences coming to commerce as well. So what is the main challenge there? If you compare personally how much time you spend on socials versus how much time you spend on an online shop, I think you'll find an imbalance and that you're probably tending to spend more and more time on socials, which is obviously not a bad thing per se. But as a brand or retailer, the question's like, well, great, if the entire front end of the customer journey, the discovery piece is happening on social, what does that leave me with, right? And so it's really about reconnecting with your community and trying to bring that kind of discovery and entertainment to your own e-commerce as well, or sharing that experience with social, by the way, it's completely complementary, um, and really discovering how you can bring that engagement for your community as well again. Thanks so much. Yeah, I, I, I would say that just about any digital channel engagement is, is, is such a key factor and, and um, not being limited to engagement in one channel versus another uh, is, is a key capability for, for businesses engaging in this type of strategy. Um, great. Um, Kareem, I've got one for you. Uh, how, um, so could you share um, just, just a brief timeline on how your omni-channel has developed in, in recent years? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's been within the last, let's call it four to five years that we've really gotten more interconnected. Uh, historically, we've always been a sort of offline company that has an online presence. And what I mean by that is, is that we have always been a consulting based company, a company that looks to provide supply chain solutions. So in this way, you know, you have to meet with customers face to face, you have to uh, talk with them on the phone, you have to understand their ins, their outs and their needs, which in many ways are, are very kind of traditional based methods. Um, however, as we realized, in order to truly scale and grow and develop, we needed to build up more of the, the digital side, the polling side, the screening side of potential customers and clients that actually made sense for our type of services that we provided. And so really, it's been in the last, I'd say, five plus years that we've looked to integrate across multiple channels uh, that make a lot of sense and therefore allow us to grow and build and screen um, effectively so that we can make the best use of our time and services to offer to customers. Um, so with this in mind, I mean, we're talking about things like a larger scale YouTube presence where we talk about the kinds of productions and things that we do and best practices and protocols, which is a mixture of educational uh, components, a larger LinkedIn presence. Um, you know, uh, we obviously have a presence with Alibaba, which is a great way to bring in opportunities and screen and develop as the first US-based verified supplier. Um, you know, there's there's a very long list of, of, of uh, platforms that we've, you know, focused and developed and integrated um, through an omni-channel type of strategy now that allows us to be most effective as an organization for, for our customers and for our general process. Brilliant. Uh, thanks. And just a, a slight follow up to that. Um, it, when you're examining your your existing channels, um, how would you decide which one to invest in versus divest in? And what type of tracking do you employ the most? Well, I mean, when you're talking about uh, different types of strategies, the ROI sort of benchmark moves and it, and it really will depend upon what you're looking for. So when we're talking about things such as, you know, YouTube, um, for example, that's going to be about viewership and subscribers and how many inbound requests you get every day, week, month, and then making determinations on if the, um, if the, the, the juice comes out of the squeeze, if you want to call it, you know, with the amount of, um, effort and, and capital you may put into that, because when you produce, let's say content, 
um, there's costs associated with that, right? There's there's uh, video costs and editing costs and on-site costs, and then there's there's obviously any kind of promotional cost if you're doing it through uh, platforms that then proliferate, you know, whether it's through YouTube or Sprizzy or any of these kinds of services that assist with the dissemination of content. Um, so far to date, we have found it to be very successful from a branding standpoint and from an informational standpoint. And, and we've gotten enough requests that have come through the door that it, it tends to make sense. Um, same thing really goes with any other platform that you decide to put efforts into. Um, you know, I know for a while, um, you know, we would go to different trade shows and events in the idea to, let's say, pick up a bunch of email addresses, drop them into something like a MailChimp or a Clavio type of platform and sort of see how that goes. And, and a presence at a show, which is an offline traditional mechanism you know, was was trying to build into some level of an online uh, mechanism, which was, again, email and, and marketing and so forth. And that was not successful. That was not a successful strategy at all, because you may have had some great conversations at um, at these shows and events, but to just pick up a bunch of email addresses um, by offering some reason as to why people would want to give you their email addresses and then following up afterwards was just not a very successful approach uh, in that way. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of things that you have to try um, to, to basically see what ends up being, you know, your best opportunity and the and the benchmarks, as I said, really change depending upon what that what that medium is. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. Sorry, do you mind if I also add to that? So to Karine's point, you're using YouTube for engaging your community, right? And then there's some sort of gap in experience. And then later you're hoping to re-engage them on whichever platform like Alibaba you're selling through. But there's a gap, right? And that's essentially whether it's B2B or B2B2C or B2C, that's exactly also what we at least want to solve. The fact that in the West, we have these ecosystems which are completely splintered, right? And why for users can the experience not be seamless? Why can't you be doing you know, a video on YouTube alive perhaps and you know have the shoppability of the product or signing up for an order or you know whatever it is in whatever context b2b or b2c why is that not seamless for the user and that's exactly where we come in and we say that's our ultimate vision that anybody can move freely between all these platforms um and at lisa we want to enable that infrastructure and we want to be the sort of glue in the middle if you will ultimately to help everyone have a better more seamless transition between all of these types of experiences Great. Thanks. Thanks so much for that. And actually, that 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 leads me uh, well into my next question for you, Sophie, which is, um, could you share any example of a successful uh, offline to offline or sorry, offline to online campaign um, that that leveraged this type of solution? So one of my favorite examples, well, I have two, actually, one is Avon and one is Marks and Spencer, uh, both of whom we've been working with for over almost three years now, I think, which if you consider that social commerce is so fairly new in the West, it's quite a long time. Um, so Avon, as I'm sure you know, is a business to business to consumer, like multi-level marketing business model. Uh, but they use us mostly in a business to business context. So this came about when during COVID, they couldn't host their annual uh, festival for their brand representatives where the brand representatives come to learn about the new product launches to get educated etc and also to buy the avon products to then resell them to their clients right so avon was like oh my god what are we going to do we can't host this in person we need to move it into a virtual environment and they approached us and they said hey you know can you help us do this it's going to be like probably 20,000 participants and we want the entire weekend to be streamed online, but also to be interactive and shoppable at the same time, right, which is what we do. Um, and so they did. And it was a huge success. The guy who runs the events team at Avon was like, it's the first time I have a positive ROI off an event. I'm like the biggest hero in the company now. No one's ever done that before, which is, you know, of course, it's a different business model suddenly if you move it virt into a virtual environment. And now consistently what they do is that Avon, the brand, and um, there's a whole bunch of like inspirational and also educational content for their resellers to learn about the products, which obviously helps them to then when they go and, you know, work with their customers, 
uh, to be better at also selling and explaining the products to their customers. So that's an interesting, almost B2B, if you will, use case. Um, and I say that's a sort of offline to online transition because for me, Avon is like the inventor almost of physical social commerce. I mean, you know, that's what the business model is. So how do they transition this business model into an online space? It's kind of exactly what's happening right now. And the other really interesting example is Marks and Spencer, who we've been working uh, with, like I said, also for over two years. And, you know, typically when we start working with brands and retailers, there's this assumption that when they start doing live or video content, that what their customers will want to see is influencer created content. And that can be the case. But for those brands and retailers that actually have experts in their teams, like in-store staff, people that talk to customers every day, that is much more successful for almost all of these customers that have, or these kind of retailers or brands that have staff that are just really great and they know a lot about their products and they're very authentic. Yeah, and so Marks and Spencer does like 90% of their live and video content is done by their own staff and customers love it. Um, so those are two examples that I can share where we really see a really nice symbiosis between sort of offline expertise and humans and a digital experience and community. That's that's really neat, especially I, I, I imagine every department store or big um, multi-location operation has lots of staff like that that be able to produce content for a pretty limited budget. Yeah, um, and also use their time, potentially somewhat idle time. <laughs> Uh, you know, doing something fun and extending also their capabilities to talk to more customers than maybe the ones that walked in. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed. Awesome. So, so um, st sticking with the social aspect for a moment, I, I've got one for Kareem uh, and a very similar one for you, Sophie. So if this, if you both jump in on that one, it's also fine. Um, uh, Kareem, um, since, since you're uh, primarily in the B2B spaces, uh, which traditionally aren't 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 as robustly served by um, social sites. How do you sort of balance your your increased uh, presence uh, on those social sites with maintaining a a, a very professional um, persona in the B two B space? It's a good question. <laughs> That's a very good question because you know, a perfect example would be let's say the supply and demand show, right? That we do, which is a podcast. The idea behind that is to somehow humanize the uh, the supply chain industry and to take a little bit of a lighter hearted take on what that is. And in doing so, we bring on, you know, CEOs and C-level, um, you know, uh, professionals to come onto this show from some of the largest businesses and talk very freely about their ins and outs and issues and problems because our business has always been to be a global supply chain solutions provider. So a show that's kind of dedicated to, hey, come on in here and tell us about your nightmare stories and everything that when the train went off the tracks and so on, it gives a nice sort of backdrop to then be able to, to transition into, well, here is how that company that's on this show is trying to solve those things. And here is how we as a company, the Atlas Network, is also looking to solve global supply chain solutions problems, because as you guests talk about this, here's three examples of things we've dealt with in the last, you know, several decades that mirror this or are in contradiction to this and so on. So professionalism is a, is a, is a bit of a difficult word to kind of wrap your arms around when it comes to social, because professionalism means different things to different people. But I do believe that as long as you are maintaining the, um, the uh, essence of your message and the essence of what your organization and company does, and you're not obviously being, you know, overtly rude or doing things that are, you know, things that would be just generally considered to be unacceptable, then it really, media is, is a positive thing. Um, and, and you just, the balancing act, as we talked about before, comes with how much dedication and time you put into it and what kind of ROI you really get out of that. Um, as we discussed before, uh, maybe that even comes into some of that concept you were talking about earlier with the, the differences between having a balanced versus a focused approach. 
Um, you know, some of these things are a bit more balanced. They're, they're wider spread. They're not so laser guided because you're just trying to bring attention to a subject or to an industry or, or so forth. Um, so uh, generally speaking, I would say that, you know, the use of social can be extremely positive, um, can bring uh, more attention to your business and to your company, as long as you have the proper intention about it. And you and you set some some guardrails as far as how far you're willing to go and 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 not go. Great, thanks so much for that. And uh, in a very similar um, vein, uh, Sophie, maybe maybe you could um, shed some light on common mistakes you see companies of all sizes engage in when doing um, social commerce generally. So there's different formats to social commerce. So at its core. Maybe also just to explain what it is, you take a piece of content, a picture, a short video clip, a long form video, a live stream, whatever it is, you put an interaction layer on top of it, right? So you chat or you can comment or you can like something. So there's some way that people start engaging with the content and with each other. And you have this third element um, of being able to buy the product directly, right? So really what I'm doing is I'm telling Kareem, for example, hey, if you're going to go make that YouTube show, why not repurpose it on your, you know, use our tool to repurpose it as a shoppable video on your website and drive sales off the back of it rather than it like fizzling out at some point on YouTube, right? Um, the most common mistake I see is that most people associate social commerce mostly with live shopping, which is a big part of it. And that especially brands and retailers for some reason, actually, I know the reason now that I've been doing this for six years. For some reason, there's this innate fear in people that if they are the ones that made the decision to put their brand live, and if something goes wrong, they will be fired. Mm. That's it. That's the core of it. And for like, I don't know, I'd say four and a half years, we were stumped because why is it so hard to sell this? You know, like we have case studies with unbelievable results. Like, why is this so hard? And then we realized their expectations of what they will have to do to make a good live show, which is something like we have to build a QVC like studio and it has to be highly produced. Those were all just irrational fears and that and the production was all about controlling the content and hoping that like nothing goes wrong. Once you break through that very quickly, it flips and they're like, oh, wait, no, authenticity is really important and people love this and people love it if something goes wrong. So. It's breaking through that, but that's obviously not so easy. So what we do now is we flip it around and we say, you know what? Don't start with live shopping. Start with the content you already have, make it interactive, make it shoppable, take little baby steps. And then they get excited about it. And then they're like, oh, actually live doesn't feel like such a stretch anymore. So the most common mistake I see um, and what is really, we're at a, very much an inflection point now, but up until now in the West, brands have just been too scared, to be honest, to be that to be the person that makes the mistake of going live, basically. Ah, so so to put a fine point on that, it um, a recurring theme in 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 life is uh, the worst course of actions often none, right? Yeah, but I mean, you know how it is with hype cycles and technologies. Like now we're coming over, and uh, you know we're we're through the trough, and like suddenly everyone's like, oh wait, there's actually something to this, and people actually really enjoy this, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But but yeah, as as to your point. Uh, they were their own biggest sort of barriers. And it's just human uh, fear, mostly, more than anything else. Wow. Well, I'm glad that uh, we seem to be turning another page here, uh, in, in North America, at least. Um, great. Uh, Kareem, I've, I've got another one for you. Um, again, this one is, is highly relevant to you as well, Sophie. So should you want to follow up, please do. Um, uh, Karim, could you share us a a, a lesson um, from a from a channel that was um, that was not performing optimally, and and that you you um, took some action to improve? Sure, um, I would say that that would come by way of digital PR. That that's an important area. I think that is not off, often talked about. Um, we were looking to do more and more with regards to press releases and kind of notifications of whether it was a new technology we were working on or the announcement of a new client or whatever, you know, kind of 
newsworthy kind of pieces of information and content that we wanted to disseminate. And what we started using is, you know, some of the basic existing tools that, that are out there, um, PR web and some of these other ones where you essentially go on, you pay a little bit of some money, you write some content, you put it up and, you know, you, you cross your fingers and say, I hope a, a million people read it and care. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, that really didn't work out ever. Uh, I think we tried it, you know, maybe 10 times in, in a span of maybe one year and so forth, just, you know, every month kind of putting out something and so forth. And the reason why it didn't work is, is because honestly, there's a magic to that. There's a magic and there's a science to that. And sometimes the sort of do it yourself services don't always give you the best results um, for what you're looking for. I mean, they can be a great starting point or can educate you on different areas, but sometimes you need a bit more of, of, a, of a background or, or some level of a service provider to really take you to a next place. And that's where we decided as a group to actually hire a media, you know, a media and PR agency, a firm that was not only going to get us great digital content, but was going to have it be disseminated properly, um, put onto channels that were that actually cared to have those noteworthy stories on them, such as tier one channels. I mean, we we've had most recently uh, press and fast company and USA Today and China Daily and some really large uh, tier one publications that give some of these you know notices that we were working on that you know huge projects with big clients the attention and the media that they deserve. So that would be a perfect example where you know we kind of said PR and media is important and let's tackle that. We tried it a particular way, sort of a, you know, let's roll up our sleeves and, you know, just get it done ourselves and realize that that was an area where we really needed a lot more professional help. Now, you know, some organizations have communication departments, they, you know, have their own teams and so on. That's also a, a great solution if you have people from the industry. But if you don't, you know, sometimes you have to do third party or, or outsourced services. Uh, we did that with regards to our media and PR, and it's been working out very, very well for us now. So hopefully that answered it. Yes. Thanks for that. Um, and, and, um, Sophie, generalizing this a little bit for you, um, what, what are, what are common, um, common corrections that, that you, you, that you employ, uh, to help your customers with non-performing channels? Is it just a, is it just a cut the channel and, 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 uh, have a look and consider it again later? Or do you take some, do, do you have a more methodological approach to that? No, so I literally, I told you, right, just a couple of hours ago, I was at an event um, talking more from a founder perspective of how to scale and internationalize your SaaS business. And this might seem like a very strange piece of advice, but the first piece of advice I gave is to know what kind of SaaS business you are. Why do I say that? Because for quite a long time, we were kind of pretending to be something that we weren't. And that really hurt us in many ways. So what do I mean by that? First of all, to me, there's sort of two dimensions to a SaaS business in terms of defining what kind you are. The one is, are you a one feature solution all the way up to, are you a full feature suite, right? That's sort of one dimension. And the other one is, are you going in and solving a specific problem and optimizing a piece of a process, like a work process, whether that's supply chain or manufacturing or HR, just, are you just op just are you optimizing a piece of a process or are you selling technology which somebody else needs to use in a certain way for it to work? Or do you do the latter? And that is much harder because as to your question, I depend on my customers using my technology. If they just, for example, we have a shoppable stories feature or let's say shoppable videos or shoppable lives, it doesn't matter. If they put shit content in that, which that none of their customers want to see, or if they go and they spend 10K on a production of a live show, but they don't do well at advertising it and no one shows up, they're never doing it again. So how do mm -hmm. we counteract that? So what we do, first of all, we realize, and again, it depends also where in the hype cycle you are, how mature the market is, how much it's learned and self-learned already. The positive thing is, these are all visual experiences. So once there's a lot of content, like, social commerce formats out there, brands learn from each other really fast, right? They can see like, oh, look at that. Marks and Spencer's doing a live show, but 
that doesn't look like they spend 10K on production. Maybe I don't need to spend 10K on production. So there's a lot of sort of learning, you know, in the industry happening now. But at the beginning, what we would do is really sit down with our customers. We like, we're going to help you uh, through a certain trial phase. We're going to define common goals. And we're going to have really, really close relationship in this time to work together for us to ask you on a weekly basis. Are you happy with the results? Are you seeing what you want to see? So we're basically training them to understand what they need to be looking for and what they need to be optimizing for. That's what indirectly happens. And of course, we get very close feedback. So it was a great way for us to also give them feedback on, hey, have you considered trying this or this or this? So that was the sort of early stages. And now it's nice because now you have this sort of self-learning happening all of a sudden, um, yeah, which is also new to us. We're like, hey, cool, they kind of got it. They watched that and now they're correcting it like this and we didn't even have to tell them. So there. <laughs> Great, great. Um, so this this actually leads us really smoothly into our next question, which is two parts. So there's one part for each. Um, I'll start with Kareem. Um, what what questions do you or what trends do you see in omni-channel strategies that SMBs should be on the lookout for uh, moving into the future? Trends. Um, I really like some of these platforms that that pull together all of the social media platforms into a single, you know, space. Um, the person or the group that does a lot of our LinkedIn work and and Facebook and Twitter or X um, and and Instagram uses a platform like Metricool. Um, there are some other platforms like that that really kind of are good kind of consolidator platforms where messages can be pushed across multiple platforms with, you know, single pushes. Sometimes that's a good thing to do. Sometimes that's a bad thing because Instagram audiences don't want to see the same things that Facebook audiences don't want to see the same things as X audiences and so forth. So it's not always like push a button and it goes across four things, the same message. It's, it's not a great strategy, but the idea that you can have centralized places um, is, is important. Um, you know, I believe that as we continue to develop more and more of these AI related tools, that these are going to be, you know, uh, very, very sophisticated opportunities for SMBs to do things at a reduced budget and a reduced resource level. Uh, these are some of the things you were talking about that were important for SMBs, especially to make decisions around. So as we get to a place where there are less human beings that are necessary to do some of these tasks because you could essentially have some, some AI related um, you know, innovations that can, can do some of the writing or the screening or the, you know, just, just pulling it all together in a way that makes sense holistically, it's good. I mean, we know that when it comes to omni-channel, the goals are gonna be visibility, measurement, you know, personalization and optimization. These are like the four big keys or pillars if you wanna talk about with omni-channel. So as long as we're streamlining those, reducing costs and reducing manpower to do it, which we're moving in those directions, I think that uh, SMBs are going to be able to take full advantage of that. Right. Thanks. Thanks so much. And and I was I had a hunch you were going to touch on on uh, AI, and and that 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 leads me off um, for my next question for Sophie. So. Um, so how do you see the, the impact of, of emerging tools like, like AI um, and other digital tools in um, the evolution of, of the omni-channel uh, strategies for SMBs? Well, I think, like I said, our hypothesis is that everything is going to become community-centric. So that means you're going to be designing your businesses differently. Um, and this is like, it depends on how far into the future you want to look and sort of extrapolate that thought, right? Um, but as to Kareem's point, like in the next couple of years, what's going to happen is that all processes will be optimized as much as they possibly can be through AI, freeing up resources, hopefully for more creativity and more community um interaction and more the more human let's say and creative side and empathy and all those you know great human sort of things um and yeah i think you know obviously ai has a huge role to play i mean in social commerce specifically for example a discussion that i love to have is in china it's already very commonplace and tiktok launched it i think eight weeks ago only to pull it back four weeks later because it was a shit show basically um in the us is these ai-based live 
shopping avatars. So if you're a creator, you know, suddenly, which I think is a very positive thing, by the way, if you're a creator, all of a sudden you're not live six hours a day, you're live 24 hours a day, which I don't think is a bad thing. The thing that they did wrong, unfortunately, is they had no real guardrails around it. So the AI, the AI avatars would start sort of swearing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that was obviously not a great execution, but at its core, I think that's, that's a great idea. What I will say though, what I then think will start happening in a next step, let's say that becomes commonplace, which is not unlikely. I think what will happen is that humans will start appreciating real human content even more. So who knows, maybe I'll start paying a bit of a premium to get to talk or watch the live show of the creator when he, it's really him that's live or her that's live, not his AI avatar, just sort of in the context of my business. And obviously, yes, in our tech, inside our product, you know, you know, AI for many different ways uh, of optimizing, for example, creating automated clips out of videos, recognizing products. I mean, that's all just very sensible and logic. And again, hopefully freeing up resources for more creativity. Brilliant. Any, anything you'd like to add, Kareem? No, I mean, I. that's very interesting about those avatars swearing. <laughs> I've never heard about that, but I could, I could just see how, you know, that would definitely impact the shopping experience where all of a sudden you're like, okay, I'm, I'm hanging up now. It's just too much when the robots start swearing at me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, everything needs to be tempered. And I, and I do like what Sophie said before, where she essentially said, you know, through technology, we will have the ability to do more higher thinking tasks or more creative tasks. And that's really the goal here that, you know, we're hoping that all these technologies provide um, a tool and not necessarily a crutch. And we lose our ability to be creative because we're so willing to just push a button and have something, a million things done for us. And you and I have had this discussion before, Eric, you know, what happens to where are the Shakespeare's of the world or the next uh, you know, generation of, of inventive writers or thinkers if our immediate intention is to just push a button. Um, I think that there's going to be some education that's going to be have, have to be had around that in order to make that proper balance between sort of the convenience and the efficiency. And, you know, we talk about what we gain, but what do we lose? And, and ensuring that we're, we're gaining more than we're losing um, in the end. So that's just kind of my general philosophical thoughts around this, this conversation. Great. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we could have a, a separate session just on this topic and, and uh, I'll tentatively look forward to that as well. Um, now, uh, before we wrap, I just want, I want to leave, um, I want to leave our panel with, with one question and I would also like you to, um, to, to close by uh, plugging your links, should you like. So um, the question is really um, to the mem members of the audience who just want to know what to do next. So what would you say are the very first steps that you recommend SMBs consider uh, when when building an omni-channel strategy? Uh, Sophie, you'd like to go first? <laughs> well, staying with our core hypothesis that community is the future and having a community-centric strategy online, offline, across all channels, um, my advice would be to start thinking from day one, the value that the, your community has. And, you know, community is made up of customers, employees, fans, maybe influencers, whatever that is. And to think from day one, even if it's, you start with 10, like, you know, I'm not talking about huge brands with huge, whatever fandoms. I, just think in a structured and strategic way about that community and how you're going to be interacting with them consistently across all channels and how you're going to manage that community interaction that would be my advice because i think that's the really the nugget or uh, the ticket to survival in the future if you don't have that you know loyal community it's going to get really hard to survive yeah right. um, I, I would i would uh echo what sophie said there for sure and i would also add to just really know your service and know your product so that you can then be able to then extrapolate from that to know your audience. And once you do those two things, you know, know really who you are, what you are, what you're selling or providing and what audience 
cares the most about that, from that place is where you can then be able to create or look at the omni-channel strategies that are going to help you to disseminate that message of what you are and what you do to those people. And because there's just a million different flavors of ways that you can get that across and you, you need to start with those two essential kind of building blocks and then backtrack into, okay, we're going to, you know, create a bunch of content video or, or it's uh, PR or it's um, Instagram and images or whatever it may be um, to really get across that message. But the, but the, the starting points are know who you are, what you are, and then know who the audience is that cares about what you are and then go from there. Perfect. Couldn't, couldn't have summarized better myself. Um, so thank you so much. And, and um, thanks, thanks to our audience for joining today. And before we go, I just want to give uh, Kareem and Sophie one chance to, to, to plug the links here. Should, should uh, anyone in the audience like to get in touch? Sure. Um, Sophie, you want to go first and then I'll go after? No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, just as Eric has said and has put up these, these links, you know, I'm available on LinkedIn um, at Kareem Kafori. My main company is the atlasnetwork.com, where we provide global supply chain solutions uh, for businesses of all sizes. Um, as far as we, we also have a great storefront on Alibaba as the first US-based verified supplier, which has lots of our products and ways to get in touch. And then just on a personal note, um, you know, I do have a, a book that just came out called Supply Chain Seesaw, The Ups and Downs. It's a very short um, an exciting read for those that know a lot about supply chain or for those that have no idea and are just trying to get involved or, or know a little bit about it. It's, it's uh, written from a very much being in the trenches uh, perspective. It's, it's, it's a bit academic, but mainly more personal um, experiences. And uh, thank you so much again for having me on the, on the, the show today. Of course. Thanks for coming. Sophie. Yeah, from my side, anybody who's generally interested in the topic of social commerce, uh, you know, definitely follow me on LinkedIn. I've recently launched my first own newsletter called The Social Side of Commerce, um, which really looks, yes, at social commerce, but in a much bigger context. Um, email inquiries, if anybody's specifically interested in, you know, social commerce solutions for their brand, potentially. Um, but also generally always happy to connect uh, with like-minded people that are interested in, you know, shaping the future of commerce, um, reach out. <laughs> Brilliant. And so um, let me, let me thank Sophie and Kareem one more time um, for joining today and sharing these insights with us. And uh, should you want to get in touch or, or learn more about Alibaba's programs for North American SMBs, uh, here's, here's my link over here. Uh, and uh, wish everybody uh, a, a pleasant day and the very best of business. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Cheers, guys. Thank you again. I really appreciate it, Eric. And Sophie, nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Hope uh, hope to see you soon in real life. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> yes, we should we should definitely catch up on maybe a few things. We'll we'll talk on LinkedIn or otherwise and, and communicate for sure. Brilliant. All right, guys. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. See you Bye. all soon. Thank you again.